Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Sorry about that. Looking forward to uh, looking forward to a great session. And you know, this is really going to uh, be helpful to all of you, whether you're in leadership roles or not. On what are some of the things that you can do to to help build great teams? So we've called it creating outstanding teams. That's something that. Uh, as a business, we're very passionate about, and we work with a lot of a lot of great leaders and a lot of great companies on this. And I think it's it's helpful for everybody, whether you're in a, a management position or otherwise, on what are some of the things that we can do to help make the teams that we're in and the people we work with uh, outstanding. And one of the themes that we're going to cover off uh, is, is this concept of building a high performance team. That's really the, uh, the the essence or the main outcome that we want you to walk away with at the end of this session. So happy to uh, kick in, get into it, Sarah. Right, and we're just going to talk um, the webcam, take the webcam off now for John, um, just so we can focus on the presentation at hand. So um, off we go. Fantastic. Okay, so what I'd like to do to, to kick off is just to, just to get you thinking is I'd like to, to give you a few uh, thought starters to just sort of maybe start to challenge a few ideas that you have around what building great teams are all about and what, what do we mean when we're talking about high performance. So there's a, a couple of, I suppose, myths that I'd like to, to challenge and some myths that you may need to let go that's going to make today a, a really useful presentation for you. Uh, the first is um, this concept of teams. A myth you need to let go is that teams are, are defined according to an organisational chart. So if we think about who's in a team based on where they sit in an org chart, that's one of the myths that I want to challenge today. Another one that I want you to consider and think about is a myth that uh, a person's role so the role they play in an organisation, that is defined primarily by their job description. So if that's something that any of you think and feel, then today is going to be, going to be useful. That's another myth that we want to, we want to work with. And the third myth that I, want, uh, that I want you to let go is that high performance or a high performance team is any team that is achieving great tangible results. If we feel we're getting great tangible results, that technically means we're high performance. That's a myth that I'd like to challenge uh, today, if that's something that some of you feel, which means today will be useful. Uh, some beliefs that I'd also like to challenge, things that you may think to be true, uh, that are often not true, is that most people don't perform because they're not motivated. For any of you in a leadership position, this is going to be something that will be really helpful is to start to think that, okay, just because they're not delivering, that doesn't mean that they don't want to. It doesn't mean they're not motivated. I want to, I want to challenge that belief. Uh, the next is that a uh, common one that we hear is that most team issues uh, relate to hiring the wrong people because we've brought the wrong people into the business. That's actually going to be one of the reasons why we're not performing. And finally, uh, another belief, a really important belief that we're going to do a poll for you all on later in the presentation is that we need to accept that not everyone's going to get along with each other. And there's always going to be personality issues and we just need to live with that and deal with that. That's another belief that I'd like to challenge. So if any of these probably relate to some of your current thinking, then today is going to be, going to be really valuable for you. So moving into the next bit, before I do a poll with you, I just wanted to uh, cover off what, what Sarah introduced in the, in the description of today, which is just the basics of what makes a team. Before we understand how to make a team fantastic and how to turn it into a high performance team, let's just be clear about what we're dealing with. There are three elements to, to, for it to even be considered a team in the first place. The first is that we need to have a group of people, meaning it's got to be a team, it's got to be more than one. So one person can't be a team, but once we have more than one, we're, we're underway. But even at that point, uh, it's something that's worth reflecting on is whether everybody in that group would actually be able to articulate who else is on the team. Quite often we have leaders who believe that they've got a group of people who are meant to be a team, but not necessarily everybody in that group knows who else is on the team. To even start the journey of building a great team, everybody else knows, needs to know who else is, is on the team with me. The second is that for it to be considered a team, there needs to be a common cause. The reason a group of people come together is to work towards something. And that means we need to have a really clear common goal. And everybody in that group should be able to articulate what the cause is and articulate that cause in the same way. So good point to reflect on whether if you're thinking about a team that you're in, how many of the people in that team would be able to describe a common cause and describe it in the same way. And the third element is every person in the group needs to play a role. And that's something that we're going to spend a bit of time on in today's presentation, is what we mean by a role. Because for it to be a team and to achieve that cause, every person has a very special uh, part to play in achieving that. So that's really the building blocks of, of what makes a team. So I just want to make sure that we know 
what those three elements are before we start moving into how to make those teams fantastic. And I think what I want to do is actually kick off with a poll at this point before yeah. I sort of give away the next, probably give away the next answer. But what I'd like to do, Sarah's going to just um, put a poll out there where when it comes to uh, high performance, I just want to get a sense from, from, from all of you about how, how many of you would actually consider yourself to be in a high performance team right now. Right. So if you do currently consider yourself to be in a high performance team, simply click yes and if you don't then no. Um, and if anyone has um, anything else that they'd like to elaborate on with this question, please feel free to type it in the chat box down below. Um, be good to get a sense of engagement online to see what people are also thinking within their teams. Um, do you usually get a similar um, or a similar response when you ask this question over and over? <laughs> You know what, actually looking at that response, which is about 50-50, yep. definitely yes. So that's actually a pretty common response. Quite often it's actually more favourable, like a lot of people would consider themselves to be in a high performance team. And the reason I ask that question is because our definition of high performance is actually the, the big learning from today and what people consider to be high performance is the why we'd say yes. Mm. So I'm thinking, I'm suspecting that as we go further into the presentation, those of you that maybe have answered, uh, have answered yes might be sort of, might be challenging that a little bit. but. The main reason for that is because we're getting great tangible results, mm. which, is, uh, which feeds into the next bit. So thank you. Thanks for those who have responded. Thank you. So to move on, what does high performance mean? Well, the first thing I want to do and the reason we asked that poll is I just wanted to give you a definition of, of performance, that word performance. If we went to back to the 20th century, so up until about 15 years ago, when we were talking about performance, it was a really simple definition, and that is what results have we achieved or what results have we delivered? And those results were often tangible results. In the 21st century, very relevant for high performance organizations and high performance leaders, leadership now is a combination of two things. That's the results that we get and the behavior that we've shown to get those results. That is the technical definition of performance in the 21st century what we achieve and how we achieve them. And the reason they're both there is because, and the reason we have behavior as a big part of it is because for two reasons. The way people behave in a team, not just leaders, but everybody in a team, the way people behave has an impact on other people's ability to deliver their results. And also the way you go about delivering results through your behavior impacts the likelihood of you achieving great results again in the future. And that's why for, for great teams, we need to be thinking about what we're striving for, but the way we go about it and the way we work as a team. So a lot of, of this concept of building high performance is going to point to the sort of culture that we have within our team. That's going to be one of the learning outcomes we're going to get from the rest of the presentation, is how do we make sure that everybody in our team are focused on the way they behave with each other as well as the results that they're delivering. That's what we mean by performance. Now, in order to put some structure and some definition around that, moving on, what I now have here is um, what we would consider to be a really simple definition of, of what's required to build a high performance culture or a high performance team. We call it the five drivers of high performance. This is going to be relevant for, for any of you who are leading teams, even project teams or senior leaders that are leading quite large organizations. These principles of high performance are going to be very relevant for all of you. And what we're going to do in the presentation is work through each of those individually and then we'll have a couple of polls as we go. And this is probably good as we go through this next part. If any of you have got some questions or things that you want to, things that you want to ask as we go, I'm really happy to receive those because the, as we work through each of these five drivers, that's where I want you to feel that you're, that you're getting the learning outcomes and, and you're understanding what, what, it, what it takes to build a high performance team. So feel free to ask those questions. And they are leadership, ownership, relationships, innovation and achievement. So for us to get to a point where if we, if we ask that poll again, if we were to sort of go back and, and ask that poll maybe in a week's time or in a month's time or six months time and said, do you consider yourself to be in a high performance team, you'd be answering that question from a couple of perspectives. First of all, do I feel we've got those five drivers in place and are we delivering great results and great behavior? That would then mean that you would answer, uh, you'd answer a yes to high performance in the future. So moving on, to, to kick off, Getting into uh, leadership, 
in order for it to be a high performance team, we need to have uh, great leaders. And that's obviously a big focus of, and the starting point for all great teams and all great organisations is we need to have great leaders. We can't have a high performance team unless we have high performance leadership. And the reason this relates to high performance, the reason leaders are important is for there's three things that they provide. The first is that they ensure that there's a clear and compelling, a clear and inspiring purpose for the team. And what I mean by that is that the, the leader is ensured that that group of people are clear about why the team exists. So the question around purpose is why are we here? Why does this team exist? What's the reason for us being here? So an example of that is if I think about uh, an IT, the IT division of a, of a major organisation in Australia, when they were thinking about their purpose of why actually are we here, they sat down as a group and they went through a lot of different words and a lot of different exercises, but then the director just said, well, we're here to help the rest of the business achieve. And that actually became really clear for them. That became their purpose. We're here to help you achieve, you being other parts within, within the organisation. And everybody got that. The role that they play and the role that the IT team played within that business was to enable the rest of the divisions and the rest of the departments to achieve their goals. Another example is a major blue chip company in Australia was we were working with the finance team and within every finance team there's uh, the credit department, the accounts payable, accounts receivable team. And they were trying to work out what their purpose was. And a lot of people in the team originally thought that the reason we're here is to just collect, collect payments, collect invoices, which isn't really inspiring and isn't really clear. It just sounds more like what they do. But then the leader of that team, the national credit manager, actually came up with a different purpose. He said, well, the reason we exist for the business is to bring in the cash that allows the organisation to invest in growth. We, we, we exist to provide working capital to the rest of the business. And that actually then had a much more inspiring impact on the rest of the team because they were clear now about the role that they play in the greater organisation. That first point on a clear and inspiring purpose and how it relates to leadership, leaders need to be creating a connection between the team that they're leading or the team that they're part of and the greater organisational purpose. This is where we fit into the bigger picture. The next point that that leads to is then ensuring the team has a compelling vision. And a vision, quite simply, is what is the overarching goal that we need to achieve in order to fulfil our purpose? So we know why we exist, so what does success look like? What are we all striving for to ensure that we've made that happen? That's what we mean by a vision. So to give you an example and to go back to the IT department in that major organisation, so they exist to help the rest of the business achieve, their vision was to make IT simple, easy and reliable. That became the goal that they... ..they needed to work towards. That was the, the most important thing they could do to help the rest of the business achieve. From the credit department within the other, the other organisation who have realised that we exist to provide the cash and working capital for the company to invest in growth, their vision became to build an outstanding customer service relationship with all of our vendors and retailers. That became the goal that everybody in that team needed to work towards. I said at the beginning that performance is around results and behaviour. And the first part of a high-performance team is for the leaders to be able to articulate what, what are the values of the way we work here? What's the code of conduct that we would expect? What are the behaviours that we would want to see for those who are part of this team? And those behaviours define the culture of the team. Everybody who's working in that team not only needs to be striving towards that common goal, but need to be treating each other, uh, treating other departments, treating customers um, from a perspective of those, those set of behaviours. And I suppose just to finish off the piece around leadership, because what I've talked about there is that the role that leaders play in creating that cause and creating those behavioural expectations for a team. But the other thing that leaders are really important at and critical at, they need to be the role models. So for high performance to even start, everybody in a team needs to be inspired by the leader themselves or the team leader, whoever the particular leader is. I've got to see that person as a role model of the team values and I need to see in every conversation, every interaction I have with the leader that I understand the purpose and vision. That leader is constantly telling me about the reason we're here and the goal that we're, the goal that we're striving towards. And if I ever want to understand what the expectations are around behaviours for being in this team, I have to look no further than my team leader because they are the role model. So it's probably a good time if there's any 
any questions, if anyone's got any comments on that, feel free to shoot those through. Yeah, no questions yet. But just going back to the beginning when we were talking about um, yes or no, whether people consider themselves in a high performance team, Helen um, made a comment that you need shades of grey. What are your thoughts on that? Around but shades of grey results in behaviour. Yeah. Great, excellent. Yes, no, absolutely. You do need, probably the thing I'd say around shades of, shades of grey is that we need uh, high performance teams in the 21st century need to be comfortable with these the intangibles is probably what I'd say to respond to that, which I think is absolutely is very true. In the 20th century, it was very black and white that you know this is kind of this is the result that you've got to get, or this is how you need to behave. And I sorry, this is the result that you've got to get. Now it's around this is the result we're striving for, and this is the way to behave. And I agree that there's going to be you know shades of grey because we need to kind of have um, some flexibility on those. And probably the way I'd answer that is that what great leaders do when it comes to particularly the the behavioural aspect is we have, I guess, some just some guiding principles around our values of how we want to work. And then we have these things called big rules. And big rules are kind of like there's some non-negotiables that are important. If you're part of our team, this is how we want you to, to work and how we want you to treat each other. Now, the thing about big rules and the thing about values is there's going to be some flexibility there from time to time, but you can't actually break them. It's a little bit like a jumping castle. So you can sort of move around at times depending on situations, but you can't actually break through the wall on those. But I think the other piece around shades of grey is that you know teams and leaders in the 21st century need to be really comfortable with the fact that we're going to be striving for some results and some outcomes that aren't really black and white and tangibly measurable. Right. That's probably how I'd answer that if I've understood the question correctly. Great. Well, we'll move on now. Um, if anyone does have any more questions for John, um, please feel free to type them into the box and we'll get to them. Thank you. So the th second thing we need in place for a high-performance team is, is ownership. Now often we, uh, when we work with teams and work with businesses, we pose a question to people to, which is an open question around what's the difference between responsibility and accountability. Now, that's not a question that we're putting, uh, putting out to, to you all today, but it's a really important uh, point to consider when you're thinking about high performance and this concept of ownership. The difference between accountability and responsibility, accountability is something that you give it. It's given to you. So everybody in a team or everybody who works in a business is going to be held accountable for things at certain times. That's true for all of us. But responsibility is our response to that accountability. Ownership is when everybody in a team is taking responsibility for their accountabilities. Everybody is making that decision, that conscious choice to succeed. I know what the business or I know what my leader is asking of me in terms of the accountabilities, but I personally have got to make that choice to own it and to take full responsibility to put my heart and soul into delivering those accountabilities. That's what we mean by ownership, and that's what we mean by high performance. So for this to happen, everybody in the team, including the leader, need to understand and own their role. And that's the bit that I'm going to spend a bit of time on today, is this concept of a role. Because for us to, have, to, to truly achieve high performance, what I want to do is just help you and challenge all of you around this understanding of, of what we mean by a role and what is it that we want people to take responsibility for. To give a really simple definition, a role is defined as a person's unique contribution. So at the start of the presentation, we talked about the, the three elements of what makes a team. And that third element was that everybody plays a role. And to keep that really simple, the role is how does that individual uniquely contribute to team success? What is it that they bring that's really special that allows that whole group of people to achieve the common cause? That's what we mean by a unique contribution. And that means that every single person in the team is important and every single person in the team is special and plays a very special part in all of us being successful. And if anybody in that group doesn't think that, then it's not technically a team. So this is a piece where I'd like to just spend a bit more time in the next, the next part of the presentation is to go through what we mean by a role and what we mean by unique contribution. Now, there's a couple of questions coming through. Yep. Um, yeah, so Sarah, have you got... Did you want to go to this one? Yeah. From John, um, a fellow John. How do you avoid burnout in a high-performance team who are literally under-resourced and delivering 110%? They are well aware of the purpose, values, and visions, but is that enough? Okay, that, that's a fantastic question. Look, what I might do is actually, with that question, John, I might actually come back to that after the next couple of slides because I think you've, what's really great there is you've got, you've got a clear cause so everybody understands what we're striving for. 
I've got a feeling that the next couple of slides might actually help with that question and maybe right. come back to it because what you're talking about is people in the team feeling burned out and, and, and stretched in terms of time. So what I might do is, is go through these next few slides and then see if we can come back to, come back to that question, but it's a, a great question. So if I move on, uh, and just remind me, Sarah, to make sure I come back to that. I will. <laughs> so what I want to do is, um, uh, is just uh, talk about two different concepts, because I've mentioned the word role here. And what I want to do is just compare it to another word that gets confused with role often, and that is this thing called a job. Now, we all have a job because we all come to work and we all get paid. I'm not saying the word is obsolete. <laughs> I'm just saying in the context, the context of, of high performance and building a team. What we want to do is start to get everybody in a team to think more in terms of a role versus a job. And a simple way to, to talk about the differences is when we're thinking as a role, what we're looking at is that my unique contribution to the business is around the outcomes that I create, so the outcomes that I'm delivering, as well as the benefits that I bring to everybody else in the team that allows us to be successful. Whereas when I'm describing a job, I'm talking in terms of tasks and activities. What are all the things that need to get done? And this is actually quite an important distinction, and it's going to start to relate to, to John's question, is when we get people thinking in terms of outcomes and benefits, what am I striving for? The mindset that that creates for people in a team is what is it that I need to achieve? When I'm looking at my unique contribution, I'm thinking what is it that I need to achieve for others? The benefits I've got to create and outcomes I've got to deliver, that means the team can't be successful unless I've made that happen. Whereas if people in a team are thinking in terms of a job, and thinking in terms of tasks and activities, the mindset is all around what is it that I need to do? What do I have to get done? Now, the reason this is, this is very relevant for, for all teams, particularly around the timepiece, is we often ask a question of some of the groups when we're working uh, directly with a lot of businesses. We ask a, a question that we call a tough question of can you manage time? And I guess if, you th if you're thinking about that from a personal perspective, can I manage time? Now, if you the reason we call that a tough question is because it means that the, the instinctive answer is, well, yes, but the real answer is actually no. And the reason for that is that time is a finite thing, obviously. There's 60 seconds in a minute and a certain number of minutes in an hour and hours in the day. That's actually not something that we can control. But I'm sure most of you, when you think about that question, would be saying, well, it's, it's not time that we can manage, but what we do with that time, which is, in fact, exactly right. But the reason that relates to building a high performance team is that when we, when we think about uh, the unique contribution we make, when we think in terms of role and what we need to achieve, that means the person, people in a team are only ever going to be challenged by their focus at that point. Because it's not about time, it's about focus. And the reason that focus is more important than time is your focus will determine the choices you make about how to use the time that you have. Whereas when we think in terms of a job, which is built around tasks and activities, what most people will find in any team is I look at all, if I've looked at all the tasks and activities I need to undertake, I've got a list of things that I need to do, and then I'm trying to squeeze that into a, a five-day week, or I'm trying to squeeze that into whatever hours I've got, and I've, I'm saying to myself that doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't look like I've got enough time to get through all these tasks and activities. Whereas if we think in terms of a role, which is what do I need to achieve, my focus will then determine some of the choices and often difficult choices I need to make about what I do and don't do. So that's one of the things that I just want to challenge you on is around whether the team are thinking in terms of, of focus versus time being the main issue. That is not to say that time isn't an issue because as, as businesses grow and teams change, where there's obviously going to be points in time when we do hit capacity, which could be an issue for, for what John's asking about. But everybody who thinks in terms of a job in terms of tasks and activities is going to find time the enemy because there's never going to feel like there's enough hours in a day for us to get through all the tasks and activities versus what we need to achieve. Hmm. Now, Sarah, any questions that have come through there? Because I'm still going to come back to John's other question. No, just, um, well, there's one come through now, but just um, everyone out there, just a reminder that the slides will actually be sent uh, within 48 hours along with the presentation. Um, and we have a question from Danielle. So how do you maintain high performance in teams in an environment of organisation change where the vision and purpose of the organisation are evolving? Fantastic. Mm. Great question. So look, this is, a, this is, I guess, one of the reasons why you know, these principles of high performance are, are, are really important. So I think there's a couple of things here. Generally speaking, a, a purpose, particularly at an organizational level, organizational purposes don't change that often. 
they do they do have to change, but it, the reason the organisation exists is not something that changes a, a great deal. The vision is definitely something that will change periodically because that's that overarching goal of how we're going to fulfil the purpose is something that will change more regularly. But it's all businesses will go through periods of evolution, which sounds like that's what Danielle is going through right now. So the way we to bring high performance to that, what we've got to do, what the role of leaders are, is to to talk about that cause as being the period of change. When we're describing the vision for the team, what we need to do is talk about how the, how the business and how this team is going to evolve what we do and how we do it as part of the change journey. So we almost have a, we've got a current state, which is how we're doing things right now, and then we've got a, a vision of where we want to get to and what we're striving for. So the whole piece around high performance, of, if we just thinking with leadership and ownership for a minute, is to make sure leaders are talking about the vision of, of what, how our team is going to need to change in order to support the overarching purpose and vision for the organisation. So because the organisation purpose and vision is evolving and changing, what leaders need to do is make sure that that then relates to how the purpose and vision for our team is going to change with it. And then when it comes to the ownership piece, from a role perspective, part of that message from the leaders is to talk about the fact that our roles are going to evolve with that. So the way we've done things in the past, so the sorts of outcomes and benefits we've need to focus on in the past with our role, that is also going to evolve. And the leaders need to talk about how they see some of those things changing with the change journey for the organisation. But the other part of ownership, because we're still talking about ownership, is, is making sure that everybody in the team understands their role and how they can support and contribute to that change journey. Change is obviously very is very difficult and it's uncomfortable for us because it's not something that we like. We, we're creatures of habit. We prefer things to stay, the, to stay the same. But one of the things that leaders can do to help with high performance is to involve the team and make sure that they've taken ownership for how they can help the team transition towards that new vision. Great. So that's a great question. Uh, just moving on to the next slide around roles, we've talked about what a role is versus a job. The next thing I'd like to cover off from ownership is the two roles that we play. So we have a, and this is probably something that um, I'm going to do a poll on uh, shortly because I think it's um, depending on how, from a time perspective, how we're going to go. But a lot of people, when they're thinking about the role that they play in an organisation, generally think that they only have one role, and often that is the is around perhaps a job description that was given to them or a set of core performance KPIs. But in high performance teams, we actually need people to take ownership for two roles. We have a primary role and a secondary role. The first thing that everybody's responsible for is, is in a primary role is make a unique contribution to that growth or change strategy of the team. So back to Danielle's question around going through change, everybody's primary role is to have an understanding of what the team's striving for, but also where is the business going and how am I doing something over and above to help the team or help the organisation take that step of growth and change. That's the first thing that I need to be doing. A primary role is something that has to be proactive in nature. Uh, and in a lot of great businesses and a lot of high performance teams, this is where we would capture things like the, the over and above objectives that are not related to a person's day to day. Smart objectives that are going to help the team achieve its vision and help the business grow. And those smart objectives, uh, going back to one of the points earlier, need to relate to both tangible and intangible outcomes. So those are objectives around the way we're going to do things as well as the results that we need to deliver. That's the first thing we're responsible for. How am I contributing to the change of the business or the change of the team, supporting the strategy or vision? The secondary role is really like my day job, is how do I sort of get the core stuff done as part of my role? So this is, we call this delivering the core technical responsibilities that are aimed at helping to maintain the business and keep things moving. The secondary role, from an analogy point of view, is almost like the foundation that, of, of concrete that you pour when you're building a house. We need to make sure that there's a very stable foundation in place so we can then build. But we obviously don't pour the slab of concrete and then start doing the architectural drawings. We actually start with a vision of what the whole house has got to look like, what the building has got to look like, and we work towards that, which is why the primary role is important, but then we make sure that we've got a stable platform to build on. That's what the secondary role is about. How do we make sure that we maintain things and keep things ticking over so we don't go backwards? That is then a platform for us to be able to, to build on. And a secondary role for people in the team is, is reactive in nature. So this is generally going to be where your core key areas of responsibility or core result areas are generally captured. And again, in high performance teams in the 20th century, 
the secondary role needs to touch on both the tangible and intangible outcomes for a team, both behaviours and results. But we need to be thinking about how am I contributing to growth and change as well as how am I making sure that I'm maintaining the way we've done things in the past. Now, probably a good time to check in on some questions. Yeah, so Paul has asked, and this is an interesting one, how can you influence the creation of a high performance team in a privately owned family run company whose upper leadership are not concerned with creating a vision or purpose, they just want to get the job done? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Great question, uh, Paul, that I've, I've worked with uh, and still work with, with, with many of those businesses. So look, I think so in a case like that, if we think about from an ownership perspective, because that's actually what we're talking about at the moment, the starting point is to take ownership for your role in, in the success of the company. And one of the things to do that is, is it's sometimes difficult to get um, family run people to maybe go through that exercise of a purpose of vision and oh, it, it might be new for them, oh, just go and do it, just get things done, I understand all of that. What you can do though is, is just in the communication with them, understand what success looks like from their perspective. And it may be very simple and it may be very black and white. But what that means, that, that doesn't mean that you uh, can't still go and create a great purpose and great vision for the team that you lead, or even actually put some more meaning around some of the words that the, the owners of the family business are actually using. So even though they might have certain terms that they use, you might be able to then put some more meaning behind that when you are actually talking to your peers and when you're communicating to your team. So part of the leadership piece from high performance is to still make sure that regardless of, even if the family run business is saying, just go and grow the business and get profits and get the dollars in, you're saying, right, that's obviously the focus. So what sort of dollars do you want to achieve? What sort of profits do you want to make? What sort of growth are you after? What sort of field of play do you want to operate in? You can ask those questions of, of the family to make sure you're clear on it. That still then gives you something that you can use to then go and say, right, so based on that, I can still create a purpose and vision for my team that I know is aligned to what the owners of the business want. I know it's often easier and it's definitely a lot better if there is a really clear organisational purpose. That's definitely a really powerful thing and we know that the difference between good companies and great companies is they have a clear organisational purpose. It's not just about making money but it doesn't mean that, that leaders can't still build high performance teams in the teams that they lead. So that would be the way that I would, I would go about that. But it's a really good question. Uh, moving on. Uh, I'd like to do a poll actually at this point. Poll time. Poll time. What I would like to uh, uh, to ask you all is is a question around how it, the importance of relationships in teams. And the question that I've got is around how many of you, or to what, how important do you feel it is that people in a team like who they work with? Really simple and obvious question. How important do you think it is that you like the people you work with? And it's completely anonymous, by the way, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> it is. I hope so. <laughs> Very interesting. Hmm. No one for option three yet. Good. That's really positive. Mm. So I think looking at looking at how people are responding to that. The most important thing is, that, I guess, is that nobody's answered not at all. That's a, that's a fantastic start. There's an interesting comment there as well, which I think okay. most would agree with. Yeah, really good question there that's just come through uh, around um, don't have to like them, but do need to respect them. So that's a really, I'm really glad that you've you've actually um, you've made that comment. So that's an interesting one around that because what we're pointing to there, a lot of us would definitely have that belief that it's important that we are you know treating people with respect, the people that we work with. So they may not necessarily be our best buddies, but you know what, I, I can work with them. So the reason we've put this poll out there is because it, it is actually really important for high performance, for a team to really hit its straps, it makes such a difference when everybody does really like the people that they work with. Now that interesting, that word respect is, is it's a really important point. We have actually worked with, with leaders, a lot of leaders who have said, I don't care, you know, John, if my team like me as long as they respect me. That's something that we actually do hear quite a lot. And in every one of those cases, we, we actually, uh, put a question back to them to say, okay, let's think about people you respect. Let's put that question out there. Out of all the people who you respect, what are some of the qualities that you associate with them? And it's interesting when you get the responses to that. When we think about people who you truly respect, what attributes and qualities do they have? And 100% of the time when I've done this exercise, the sort of responses we get are things like uh, trustworthy, things like honesty, uh, they're caring, uh, they have great integrity, 
they're kind, um, you know, they're, they're committed. They're the sort of thing. Sometimes we get things like knowledgeable, but we get funny. But they're all those sorts of qualities, which then, when you look at those words, we say, well, how could you actually not like that person? Mm. How could you not like a person who's got great integrity? How could you not like a person who's caring, who's honest, who's open, supportive, all those sorts of things? So I think the reason I wanted to challenge that, and I'm glad you've actually, uh, you know, Sandy's just challenged the quote that I've got there, that, um, that you need to, we can't respect a person that we don't like. I just want to challenge that because around whether it is really respect that we have for those people. All of us who work in professional environments have got the ability to show respect, and that is to be respectful. So when we're working with somebody who we don't like, we actually know in a professional environment how we can interact with them, you know, and be very courteous and make sure we still get the job done. But do we really deep down respect that person? Mm. Because I've just got a question, if, you, if the qualities that make us respect a person are those qualities, how could we not like them? So I'm glad you've actually, uh, you've actually answered that. There's and, a few um, challenges here yeah, though, good. John. Excellent. So Sandy said um, she respects Tony Abbott for the job that he does and the fact that he stepped up to do it, but she doesn't like him that much. Um, and then Vaz also made a good point. Um, she thinks that respect is about professionalism, where whether you like or unlike someone is more about an emotional feeling. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great. So if, if I just go with that, um, the, the second one's a really good start. I think the thing with liking, and this is actually, it's a, it's a really good point, I, do, I, do I enjoy being around this person? But the, the environment that I'm in is actually still a work environment. So it's not like I've got a, by liking everybody, that means I'm going to be having barbecues on the weekend mm. and hanging out socially. That's a, that's a point that I want to challenge. I can really enjoy a person that, that I work with and actually feel that we, we achieve great things together and I love interacting with that person. But you know what, I've got family and friends outside of work. They're not a person I necessarily go and play golf with. So it doesn't necessarily need to be that, which I think is the emotional connection. But what this is coming down to is this concept of trust mm. is, what, to the extent to which I have a high level of trust with the people that I work with. And for us to have, achieve high performance, we need to make sure there are really high levels of trust. And that's one of the things that leaders do need to focus on. Whereas if I don't like a person or if the nature of the relationship has become transactional where I'm respectful for that person without respecting, and I think there's a couple of people, that, um, Paul's made that comment, showing respect versus actually having respect, that's actually really what the, the point of this is. Do, do I really actually have respect for the people that I work with? And that's, that's the point that I just want to, want to challenge because it is right. not easy. It's definitely difficult. And we have people with different personalities, different backgrounds, and different motivations. But to get to that point where we're, we can make success inevitable and become high performance, we want to really focus on building great relationships where at least when we do come to work, everybody actually says, you know what, I really enjoy the people I work with. I do like the people I work with. And I may not hang out with them socially, but I could. But mo more importantly, I genuinely respect them and we have a high level of trust and that trust means that we, everybody in the team are there to support and care for each other. This is the thing that then allows for very open and honest communication which you don't often get if people don't like each other mm -hmm. or if, it's, if there's, they're respectful but they don't really respect the person. The communication is really, really open and honest. It might be quite, sometimes it can get quite combative, uh, quite negative you know, it's, and they're the things that we want to we work on. Great. Great comments there, actually. Uh, and the bit around Tony Abbott, I think that's a, that's a good bit. I think that's a, you know, that's, that's a, yeah, yeah. And I think you know, it's, I think the thing about um, uh, not liking versus respecting him, it's the context here is probably more around people who we have relationships with. So we're talking here around uh, how important is it to have great relationships in a high performance team? They're people we work with. So I'm not I'm not sure whether. Um, you personally know Tony Abbott, but I guess not knowing a person means it's probably not liking his his style or not liking his his views or his policies is different from someone you work with where you actually have a relationship, and that's probably more the, the context there. But totally understand. Great discussion, great debate, and I just the main takeout here is I'd like you to just be thinking around: Have we built a high trust environment where uh, everybody actually feels that they can be open and honest with each other, and everybody feels that that there's great care and support for the people that I come to work with every day? Moving on, the fourth driver. So the next thing that we need to, to have a high performance team and a high performance culture is, is what's called innovation. Now innovation I know is a bit of a buzzword and it gets, it gets used a lot in a lot of different contexts, but to keep, to keep innovation really simple for, for a high performance team, it's just about creating an environment where everybody feels comfortable to challenge the status quo. In order to be a high performance team, we need a 
constantly be looking at new ways of doing things, new ways of improving, and that means that we can't ever be comfortable with, with the status quo. That's not to say that we constantly change everything, but as part of people taking ownership for their role, they need to be thinking about what are the things I've got to continually improve on to help add value to the team. And part of the reason I can challenge the status quo is because we have great relationships in place. And those great relationships allow me to be really frank, open and honest with my teammates. They allow me to challenge my leader and challenge my peers on what we're doing and what we're not doing, what we could do better. And that's all about just gradual innovation, little things that we can constantly do to improve. But one of the things that we do know about high performance environments and high performance teams is that we need to get to a point where the ideas, the, real, the great ideas are coming from the people on the ground. So particularly for those of you in, in, in leadership roles, we know that the, the best source of innovation are going to be the people who are face-to-face -face with a lot of the, the issues that we're, that we're going through, either face-to-face -face with some of the customer operational issues, because they're the ones that know what's working and not working better than anybody else. And a great team and a high-performance team is one where everybody's encouraged to be able to, to feed those ideas through. But the other part of, of a high-performance team is around the way we collaborate and cooperate with others. So I've got there a little, uh, a little phrase of one-on-one -on -one equaling three in a high-performance team. And that's because the way we collaborate and cooperate is, 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 the, is the way we actually can nurture ideas and turn them into things greater than what we could ever have done on our own. So when people contribute ideas, challenge ideas, nurture ideas, that's when the real magic happens in a high-performance team. So that's why we call it one-on-one -on -one equaling three, because two people who might have the seed of an idea, uh, when we come together and talk about it and challenge that and flesh it out, that then equals greater value than what we could have done on our own. And that's a really important thing for, for leaders is to create a, a culture of innovation where everybody feels comfortable to contribute and challenge the way we do things. And one thing that'll help uh, for all of you, just in terms of, I guess, uh, some language or words that'll help with innovation, uh, there was a book that was written a few years ago um, by Kevin and Jackie Freiberg, and I'll follow up to make sure that we send that out to you as some reference mm -hmm. reading. And they, they did some research on about a 1,000 companies in the US, and they looked at this thing called innovation, and they came to a groundbreaking conclusion that in order to get innovation in teams and businesses, you've only got to focus on one thing, and that's to remove any sentence that starts with, yeah, but. Their science, their research said, if we can take yeah, but out of the language of organizations, innovation goes to a whole other level. So statements like, yeah, but we've tried that before. Yeah, but that won't work. Yeah, but that will take too much time. Yeah, but we won't have the money for that. Yeah, but management aren't going to go for it. Those words are the things that where, even though it's done with the right intent, it actually then can, can sap people's positivity and energy to want to contribute ideas in the future. And it's just a great, a great challenge for leaders to, to try and take the yeah but out so we still positively encourage people to contribute ideas and work out a way to keep them alive. And something that may not have been a viable idea a year ago, six months ago, two years ago, might actually be a, a more viable option now. So just something to watch out. Any questions there, Sarah, that have come through from that piece? Um, no, we just had a few more people comment on the um, respect versus liking. Oh, yep. And Samantha just asked a question. Yeah, coming into a small team when there's a mentality of only doing what's needed to get the task done at hand, how to create an aspect of wanting to strive to achieve better. Yeah, fantastic. So I think that's a, um, so this is pointing to the innovation and the ownership piece. So I think that with, so with Samantha's question of, of how do we then get innovation, how do we get people out of their comfort zone and wanting to think differently, is, is to talk really positively about where the teams come from. So one of the things that leaders need to do, and particularly to the earlier question on change, is to describe the fact that you know, the team has been successful up to this point, and the team has achieved some great things. And we've achieved those things because of, of the way those people in the team have done things in the past. But then the leader needs to describe how the world has changed a little bit, and how the expectations of the change, uh, the expectations of the company have changed. So in doing that, we then can then open up a conversation to say that this is where we need to go to next. And I think the innovation and ownership piece is to involve those people who perhaps are a bit hesitant, involve those people that have only ever done it a certain way, get them involved in how they could do things differently and in what the change effort may look like. Whereas if they've only been told to do it a certain way and just this is just what your job is, you've just got to get these tasks done and that's it, they may not have ever been had the opportunity to actually contribute ideas or they may not have ever had their ideas valued in the past. 
So once you've described the context and the fact that we'd like, we'd love to hear more from you, we'd love to get you more involved, we'd love to do things differently and do things better because that's part of where the company's going, you know, that actually might then open the door for them to, to have some ideas and suggestions on that and then it's going to require the support of the leader to help nurture them, nurture them through that. It definitely is a challenge. Mm. And one, one thing that may help you there for any of you who, who do feel you've got people in teams that are very resistant, they're very job focused as opposed to role focused, very much just about doing things a certain way and, and they want to be left alone, very resistant to change. Just have a look back at the history of, of the business that you're in, the history of the company that you're in, and even the history of that team and those people, and see if you can look spot occasions in the past where there has been change. I've rarely seen businesses that you know have got a team of people that have been doing it exactly the same way for 20 years. Okay, I've almost rarely found that. Even people that have sort of been performing the same sort of role for 20 years, there's always going to be instances in the past where they've had to evolve or learn a new system or learn a new tool or learn a new process or change something in the way they're doing it. So actually, if you look in the past to find those occurrences, that gives you a story that you can share with those people to say that, hey, you know what, You're actually, we actually have demonstrated we're capable of change. We've done that in the past. This is not new for us. This is just, again, going to be the next phase of that. And we believe we can do it. Um, and just a quick one from Chris. So when entering an underperforming team, is it best to align with those that are on the bus and hold those that aren't accountable to the values? Absolutely. Totally agree. Great question, Chris. It's absolutely critical. When you, you, you've got an underperforming team, everybody in that team uh, needs to be absolutely clear about uh, what the expectation is. So what the vision is for the team and what the behaviours are that we're striving for, then everybody needs to be really clear on that. And you need to be positively recognising those who are uh, role modelling those to begin with as you start to address those who aren't. Uh, one of the things that we'll send out with the notes from this presentation is we've got a blog on something that'll really help you to do with that, which is leading a team through change. And it's called the pain triangle. The reason for that is that uh, what we need, uh, what we need to do when we've got an underperforming team, is we need to make sure that the people who are kind of doing okay, they need to understand uh, what the right expectation is. So if you celebrate and recognise the people who are doing the right thing and are role modelling the right behaviours, you need to make sure that they've got those stars to look towards. And how they go about their role is just as important, if not more important, in an underperforming team than the res technical result they've delivered in the past. So absolutely support what Chris is saying. Right. Um, we have 10 minutes left, so I think we yeah. might continue on with the presentation, the next few slides, um, and then we'll answer the rest of the questions at the end. Right. So definitely keep them coming, guys. Fantastic. So the last thing, the last driver of high performance is what we call achievement. So obviously we need to, by the nature of the word, we need to achieve things. We've got to make sure that we're delivering. So we can't be high performance if we're not actually making sure that we're, we're getting things done and making things happen. And this is all around the accountability piece. So earlier when we spoke about ownership, we talked about ownership being people taking responsibility for their accountabilities. But the last piece for high performance is we need to make sure that we have a, a culture and a structure around holding ourselves and each other accountable. We need to make sure that we are delivering on the things that we said we're going to deliver, both in a, in a results and behaviour perspective, both tangible and intangible. And one of the, the, the sayings that we use a lot for leaders and teams is this difference between inspect and expect. So really the, the key point I'd love you to take away from this is as leaders and as teams, we don't get what we expect, we get what we inspect. And what I mean by that in the context of achievement is it's not about following through and holding people accountable for every little task. It's just making sure that as a leader, we are inspecting the right things at the right time we're putting a focus around accountability on the things that really matter. So back to Chris's point before, we need to make sure that we are inspecting the way people are behaving. We need to make sure that the people who are role modelling the values, the right values, that they are actually being celebrated in the right way. Those who aren't living the values or aren't behaving the way we want are actually receiving that same inspect and being held accountable for it. Maybe there's some technical things we've done in the past or some technical results that we've delivered in the past that previously we are, were okay, but in future and the way we're doing it now and where we want to go, those same sorts of technical results are not actually what we're after. And that's what we mean by, by inspect. So an example of that is I had a, uh, was working with a, a major bank and a, uh, with an executive team who 
had after two years had been going through a cost cutting exercise. So they've been working on operational efficiencies for two years and then got to a point where as a result of only focusing on costs, they'd taken their eye off growth. And they had uh, quite a negative, quite a toxic culture within, within the division and there was quite a few issues with the leadership team and the, and the CEO. And the CEO was, was quite command and control in, in his style of leadership. But anyway, they had realised that we have, have nearly run ourselves into the ground focusing only on cost recovery and not, and not growth. And they created a new vision which was around we need to get back to business development opportunities and growing the business. New strategic partnerships was the focus. And then two days after doing this session around a new vision for growth, I got a phone call from the CEO who was in a bit of a panic because all of the senior executive team were, um, were being really negative, were not coming to work, were complaining about the CEO and his behaviour. And then what I realised is that two days after this vision session, the CEO had sent an email out to the entire executive team and the headline of that email was must fix, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. When I looked at the content of that email, there was a spreadsheet in there and in that spreadsheet was a ranking report and that ranking report had every senior executive member ranked 1 to 12 from top to bottom and who was performing the best and worst in their cost savings initiatives. And not only was there a ranking report, but if your name was 8 to 12 on this ranking report, there was a, your name was in red, and there was this red line above your name. And the reason this impacted the team was two days after we've just said that we need to focus on growing the business again, we need to focus on building strategic alliance partnerships. Which that's where we need to go. Two days after that, you've just done an inspect, which is slamming everybody for the fact that they're focused they're, they're where they're at with their cost savings initiatives. As leaders, we need to make sure that if we're following up on the right things, that whatever rate, how we hold people accountable, and having the difficult conversations when we need to be with, with the people who aren't focusing on that new that new vision or aren't behaving the way we, we want to. Uh, now, I guess a couple of things that are really important with that is this thing called communication structure. So how often do we get together as a team? How often do we connect as a team? What are the things that we talk about when we do get together to make sure that we are keeping ourselves on track and we are celebrating success and we're focusing on those really important big hitters to help move towards the vision, holding everybody accountable for their, for their primary role. And we need to make sure that we've got a culture of giving and receiving feedback. Because the feedback to each other in a team is how everybody's aware of what they're doing that's working and what they're doing that's not working. This is all part of making sure we're achieving what we need to achieve. Now, is there any uh, questions that have come through on that piece, Sarah? Um, yeah, so just also a few um, just tips and responses, I think, yeah. in terms of what other people are doing. So John says, you know, ask your staff why they come to work. Is right, it to right. pay the bills, to serve members or clients, and then get an understanding of why they're actually there? Um, or go for a higher purpose, Catherine recommends. Um, yeah. Or even invite your team to come on the journey. I'm guessing that's probably something that's not done quite a lot. People just asking. Yeah, <laughs> involving them. absolutely. Like just, I think that's a, it's a really good point around giving them the choice to succeed. But the role of leaders is to to try to create an environment where everybody wants to be successful. But then we everybody needs to make that choice. And so it is actually an invitation to say, look, we, I'd, I'd love you to come come with me, and, and do you want to be do you want to be part of it? What leaders have got to do with high performance in that first piece around creating a great cause is give them that higher purpose to buy into. The purpose is actually the thing that you would like them to believe in and want them to be inspired by. And that's why a purpose, I think going back to the question about a family, a purpose and a vision has to be quite moving. We've got to mm. find a way to make it compelling and inspiring. A purpose in the history of time has never got out of bed for that. Mm -hmm. But we need to come up with other reasons that are meaningful that then can, can inspire people to want to come to work and, and be part of something special. So it's a really, it's a really great point. Um, we've got two more questions there, but just being conscious of time and the fact that some may have to go. Um, if we just move on to the last two slides, yep, um, right. and then um, John, you're happy to stay online for the next yep. five to ten minutes to ask any Absolutely. questions. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, guys. Look, thank you. What I've just sort of been through is, is uh, those five things we need to build a high performance team, and that last piece is just around how we celebrate and keep ourselves on track. What I've done now is just moved into a slide just to probably give you a bit of context around how the world is changing around us in terms of teams. So I've called it the evolving nature of teams, and then I've got a few things. The last slide is just a few things to be mindful of in terms of where teams are going uh, in the future. And if we went back to uh, the 20th century, teams were very much uh, structured in a hierarchical sense. So 
So it was very much um, driven from a, a top-down approach to, to teams in, in what was considered the old command and control style of, style of organizational structures. Where we're at right now, we're in a transition phase of, of high performance where it's about integrated teams. And what that means is that we're actually part of many teams. So everything we've talked about today is about the fact that we're never part of just one team. We're part of multiple teams. We're part of leadership teams. We're part of functional teams. We're part of project teams. And that's actually really what high performance is about. And all of these principles apply. Where it's moving to uh, in the digital age and the age of what we call social business is where we're going to have a number of flexible, loose, and larger network-based teams. That's where things are moving. Where Teams are going to be a small part of a greater overall network, and those teams are going to be constantly changing. So that's just sort of give a sense of where it's moving. And the last slide is just to cover off, I guess, which will be relevant for everybody on, on this call in terms of where high performance is going to move to. You know, teams in the future are definitely going to be involving people from inside and outside the business. Generally, we've thought of teams more about from people inside of the company. But we're going to need to start forming some teams and having a greater number of teams that involve external stakeholders. We're going to need to try to find ways that we build teams that involve people from various disciplines and skill sets, uh, trying to actually look at ways we can sort of have some, some cross-functional skills in, in all the different teams that we build. Definitely going to be a lot more project-based in the digital age and in the, social, the age of social business. A lot of teams are going to operate for, for shorter periods. And you know, and that's actually OK. We might be a team just for a month, just to achieve one. There could be a team just for a week, where we still need to make sure there's leadership, ownership, relationships, innovation, and achievement. Uh, the nature of the workforce and where that's going is we're going to have more and more people probably working multiple jobs, working part-time, full-time, casual. There's going to be contractors. There's going to be a lot more people that are coming in and out of the organization for shorter tenures. But then we may have them working with us at different stages in their career. Teams are going to have to be extremely adaptable, creative, and flexible moving forward because we're moving into an age, the knowledge age, and we're in that the, the social age and the social environment, and that's where the collaboration and communication within social platforms from from people across a variety of geographies uh, is going to become a bigger part of, of teams in the future. And I guess with all of these, that's going to to mean that those those five principles are, are going, to, going to be even more important. So. Um, okay, so before we move on to a bit of a wrap up, um, we'll just go to the last slide there. And what we're also going to do, um, we're just going to bring up an exit survey. Um, so for those of you who um, do need to leave, thank you very much for attending. Um, but we do value your feedback, so please feel free to complete the form on the right hand side. Um, and just a note that we will actually be sending the recording to everyone um, along with a PDF uh, of the slides. Um, also the blog, a link to the blog that you were speaking about earlier, John, um, and also the ebook that you mentioned, which I can't remember the name of, but we'll get it to everyone. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining. We are going to stay online to answer a few more questions that have come through, but if you do have to leave us, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and Megan, so she's asked a question a little earlier on. As a leader, how do you facilitate the focus on role versus jobs within individuals? Okay, so, so with that, to start that off, we would always begin with the vision for the team. So Megan would need to be clear about what, what's, the, what's the, the, the cause for the team mm -hmm. that we're part of and how does that support the cause for the organisation. Yep. So that would be the start of, of that. Then based on that is to then have a conversation with, with the team member to say, given that that's the, the vision of where we're going as a team, putting the question of what are the things that you would need to do differently, what are the different outcomes and benefits that you would need to focus on achieving in order for you to have helped us get there and by saying help us get there, it implies that we're actually moving, it implies we're going in a direction. It doesn't imply that we're standing still. But that would actually would be the conversation that I would have. Okay. So if we say, here's a vision for the team, so what does that then mean for your role? What are the new outcomes and benefits you would need to achieve to help us get there? Mm, great. And Anne, so how do you get a staff of two to align to the organisational vision and everything else we've been talking about today? Okay, so that means it's team leader and two. That's great because it's actually a very a very small team, which I guess means that the relationships part is uh, is great. They might like are, each other. We, the trust <laughs> the trust bit's going to be very important, definitely when it's a small team, because if two people don't like each other in a team of three, then mm. you effectively got half the half of the company that aren't, aren't getting along. So I think I would be focusing on the trust to begin with. I guess the great thing with with a, a team of three people is you're probably in a position to be able to involve. Uh, them in, in everything. You can actually be a lot more involved in creating, okay, what, what do we think the vision of the t our team should be? 
Yep. Where do we, what, what is it we want to achieve? How do we want to get there? And what does that mean for our three roles, the three roles that we need to play? And what are the behaviours that we want? When there's three people, you can make the whole journey a conversation of just, yeah, what a, get, get them involved in everything. That's how I'd probably address that. Good. But definitely the trust piece is going to be critical in that one. I would think so. <laughs> um, and also from Anne, so what if your wider organisation has moved from an organic team back to hierarchical? Great question. Great question. It's uh, it's interesting. We've we've definitely seen businesses that are shifting at the moment towards the social business type of uh, and the high performance uh, philosophy. But every now and then, uh, if it's takeovers or there's mergers or not supposed to be really specific. If you get a new CEO comes in, sometimes they, we go back to an old way of doing things uh, because of something that's happened, or the business might be in a downturn, and there's a there's a risk factor involved. So we go back to that. Uh, that actually wouldn't change the that doesn't change um, Anne's opportunity to still have a high performance team within that the organisation. So the organisation may be going back to hierarchical in terms of how it's structured, which means that. There's going to be there might be some very black and white specific directives that everybody's got to follow, and there's going to be some tighter controls around uh, decision making and innovation and all those sorts of things. But it doesn't mean that the the team that Anne's leading can't actually still have a high performance culture within it, mm -hmm. because for us to actually, if we're thinking about our role within the organisation, part of taking ownership is we're going to say, okay, well if that's where the business is going, I've got to make the choice to succeed in that myself. Mm -hmm. So our vision as a team has got to be to probably support the business to get through that transition, still be clear about what the company needs from us, but then how do we make sure we've got relationships, innovation and collaboration, everything happening within our team and outside our team, just within the new boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it definitely is a challenge. One of the things though that I would say if you are working in a, a command and control environment or if we're actually moving to that, one of the reasons why senior leaders sort of move back to that is is because there's a fear and risk philosophy that's coming through the business. That's the reason why command and control is often often brought in. One of the things that leaders can do is to proactively go out of their way to demonstrate the ownership that they're taking, demonstrate the benefit of their innovation. Command and control is about safeguarding against risk, which means there's a fear that senior leaders have. What you've got to do is help take that fear away. So Anne and her team have almost got to sort of go over the top to say, look, you don't need to be afraid of these things. You don't need to worry about the risks here. We've taken ownership for where we're going to get to. We know the results we need to deliver for the business and here's how we're going to go about it. So it's probably the one tip that I'd give is that when you are in a real strict hierarchy, you've got to be go over the top to demonstrate how you're going to overcome the fears, risks that they might have. But it's a, uh, a great question. Great advice. All right, um, that seems to be all the questions that have come through now, which is excellent. Thank you everyone for submitting those questions. It definitely makes it more interactive um, uh, for all of us involved. So I'd now like to just quickly hand over to closing comments, John, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, um, look, I think probably the, the things to finish off with the questions that people have been asking have been fantastic. And just to leave you with, with probably challenging those beliefs, which I know there are some there that were challenged around, particularly around the relationships piece. I think mm. really just think about that. And the reason for that is if we if we do have a high level of trust with the people we work with and there are great relationships in the team, you, you want to work harder and you want to do great things for those people. So that's probably one thing that I would leave with. But just to remember that we're part of a number of teams. We're always going to be part of changing and evolving teams and to just keep coming back to those five principles, particularly if you're in a leadership role that role you play in being a champion of the cause and a, and a role model for our values. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone, that brings us to the end. I'd like to thank you all for your time for joining us today. I'd also like to thank John, it's actually his birthday and he still managed to come in and deliver a fantastic presentation, so thank you. Um, and like we said earlier, we hope that you find these uh, webinars insightful and really inspiring. They help you to apply some new things to your organisation. So thank you for joining us, um, it's been fantastic. Keep a look out for the, that information which will arrive within your inboxes in 48 hours and hopefully we'll see you at future webinars. Oh, like friendly we had a candle icon we could play or something within the <laughs> webinar. Um, thanks for your wishes, guys. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll see you again and have a great day. Bye.